On February 25, 1984, 19-year-old Donna D. Machow's life was mercilessly stolen and her remains were callously discarded in a shallow grave. For nearly 40 years, the truth behind this heinous crime remained shrouded in darkness until another woman became the target of the killer. Why did it take nearly four decades to solve the case? What was the evidence that finally cracked it? Welcome back to Mysterious Hook, where we shed light on mysterious cases from across the country. Today we'll delve into the mysterious case of Donna D. Chow, a twisted cold case from 1984 that was finally solved after almost four decades. But first, if you still haven't subscribed to our channel, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell icon below, as it motivates us to create more intriguing content for you. So without further ado, let's dive right into the mystery. East Windsor is a township located in Mercer County, New Jersey. Situated in the central part of the state, it is known for its suburban character and proximity to major cities like Trenton and Princeton. East Windsor offers a blend of residential areas, commercial centers, and natural landscapes. The township is home to various parks, recreational facilities, and cultural attractions, providing residents and visitors with ample opportunities for outdoor activities and community engagement. But despite this idyllic setting, this place would become the home of a heinous crime. Donna D. Machow's journey began on October 16, 1964, in the town of East Windsor, nestled within Mercer County. She was the cherished daughter of Betty Lou Thompson Machow and Ronald Wayne Machow. As the years went by, Donna's family expanded with the arrival of her younger sister, Julie Machow, in 1969. Life took a turn when their mother, Betty, found love again and married a man named Garland. Together they formed a blended family. Donna and Julie embraced their new life with their beloved stepfather by their side. Donna Machow had a zest for life that radiated through her love for cooking and sewing. Alongside her job as a legal secretary, she harbored dreams of a career in modeling. For Julie, Donna was a shining star. Despite the challenges that came her way, Donna never lost her sparkle and continued to embrace life with open arms. Little did she know that her path would take an unexpected and tragic turn, forever altering the lives of those who cherished her. On February 25, 1984, it seemed like a typical Saturday night for 14-year-old Julie Machow, who was relaxing at her family's home in East Windsor. When she noticed her 19-year-old sister Donna D. Machow's car parked outside, she joined her in the basement. Together they spent the night watching scary movies until 2 a.m. At that point, Julie went upstairs to her bed, ready to rest for the night. Their mother Betty and stepfather Garland were peacefully asleep upstairs during that time. They were unaware of any unusual sounds or disturbances emanating from the basement. The following day on February 26, 1984, Donna was expected to go to work at a law firm, so her absence during the day didn't initially raise alarm bells. However, as dinner time arrived and Donna still hadn't returned home, her mother began to worry. Concerned for her daughter's well-being, Betty decided to investigate by venturing downstairs to check the basement apartment. As Betty entered Donna's usually neat and organized apartment, she was greeted by a disarray of items scattered about. It was evident that a struggle had taken place within those walls. The sight of bloodstained clothes heaped together heightened her growing unease, prompting her to immediately contact the police. Once the police arrived at the scene, they meticulously combed through the entire basement their eyes keenly scanning for any trace that could unravel the mystery. Their diligence paid off when they discovered faint fingerprints near a table close to the bed. Recognizing the potential significance of these fingerprints, they carefully collected them as evidence, alongside the blood-stained clothes. 
They also uncovered traces of bodily fluid in the bedroom, an essential clue that held the promise of leading them closer to the identity of the perpetrator and help in finding Donna. In the search for answers, investigators made a grim discovery. In March 1984, when they found Donna Machow's abandoned bloodstained car near a sewer plant roughly a mile away from her home. However, despite this lead, the mystery surrounding her disappearance endured. Investigators meticulously combed through countless records. They diligently interviewed the residents living in the vicinity of Donna Machow's residence, determined to unearth any clue that could lead them to the truth. As fate would have it, the investigation took a significant turn when they suspected a number of people, including Nathaniel Harvey, a former worker at a nearby farm and resident of East Windsor. He had been apprehended and detained for his alleged involvement in a series of assaults and a chilling murder in the Plainsboro area. But all the leads, including Harvey, did not pan out at that time. The significant piece of evidence, the bodily fluid, that investigators found in Donna Machow's bedroom also went for testing. However, the technology for DNA testing was not as advanced as it is today and the testing conducted at that time lacked the precision needed to pinpoint the source of the bodily fluid. But the investigators didn't close the case and hoped that one day they would come up with some solid leads that would help them solve Donna Machow's murder mystery. The weight of the tragedy became too much for Donna's stepfather, who tragically passed away just six months after Donna vanished leaving the family to bear the weight of their grief alone. The family went to great lengths in their search for the killer. They hired private investigators, trackers, and even sought the help of psychics. They poured all their resources into the effort, spending every last penny they had. Their hope never wavered. They held on to the belief that somehow, maybe, just maybe their loved one was still alive. They couldn't shake the thought that perhaps she was injured. After exhausting all possible avenues to finding the identity of the killer, seeking solace and a fresh start, Julie and her mother made the difficult decision to move to Texas in 1987. However, their journey to healing was further marred by misfortune when their storage unit was burglarized, robbing them of precious memories. The thieves callously snatched away family photos, cherished mementos, and 16 boxes filled with investigation files, adding another layer of pain. Eleven years went by, but there was no news. But on April 2, 1995, police officers got a call from a Boy Scout troop about a body they found near Cranberry. It was not in good condition, almost completely decomposed, but when they got the dental records back, they couldn't believe they had found the most important part of the puzzle they had been searching for the last decade. It was the body of Donna D. Machow, concealed within a carpet in a wooded area near a cranberry farm, not far from where her car had been recovered. After her remains were sent for an autopsy, initial findings indicated that Donna had tragically suffered a gunshot wound to the head. However, as the case investigation progressed, the dedicated experts at the Middle Assault Regional Medical Examiner's Office delved deeper into her remains. Through careful examination, they discovered that her cause of death was indeed a head injury, although it couldn't be definitively determined as a gunshot wound. Nevertheless, the cause of death was amended to evidence of homicidal violence and her death continued to be classified as a homicide. With this crucial lead unable to yield conclusive results, the investigation gradually reached a standstill and the case eventually fell into the abyss of unsolved mysteries. In February 2022, Mercer County Prosecutor Angelo Onofre directed the reopening of the Donna Machow case. The case was handed over to the Office of Public Integrity and Accountability Central Regional Cold Case Task Force, a dedicated group within the statewide cold case network established by the New Jersey Attorney General 
in 2019. As part of the reopened investigation, all relevant physical evidence, including DNA samples, was carefully resubmitted to the state police's Central Regional Laboratory. This step aimed to leverage advanced forensic techniques and technology in the pursuit of truth and justice. Modern DNA technology played a crucial role in shedding new light on the case. The evidence, the bodily fluid which was found from Donna Machow's bedroom, was carefully re-examined, and it conclusively matched the DNA profile to Nathaniel Harvey. Astonishingly, his DNA was the only genetic material found in the room that should not have been present, according to the Attorney General's office. It was a breakthrough that provided clarity and closure to the long-standing mystery. Nathaniel Harvey, born in 1942 in East Windsor, had a troubled past right from the beginning. He had a knack for trouble and found himself behind bars for most of his life. In 1968, he got married, but the identity of his wife is not known. Living in East Windsor, Harvey had a long list of crimes to his name. He was also described as a daring intruder by the West Windsor police, and he had been convicted of assault. It was said that during his crimes, Harvey would sneak into unlocked homes, where he would take young women hostage and commit acts of violence. The authorities always had their eyes on him, considering him a potential suspect in their search for justice. One such case was of Irene Schnapps, who was also a resident of East Windsor. During the years of 1984 and 1985, the local authorities were faced with a growing concern as a series of burglaries rattled Plainsboro, West Windsor, and nearby neighborhoods. The authorities were also grappling with the unsolved murder of Irene Schnapps and the perplexing disappearance of Donna Machow, who vanished from her family's East Windsor home. Sixteen months after Donna Machow's disappearance, tragedy struck again in East Windsor when Irene Schnapps, a 37-year-old woman who had recently lost her husband to cancer, was killed. The incident occurred overnight on Saturday, June 15, 1985, or in the early hours of the following day. Concerned for her well-being, one of Irene's colleagues at RCA Americom went to her apartment the next morning on June 16, 1985, on Research Way after she failed to show up for work. With trembling hands, he informed the police about the tragic scene that he had encountered. Inside the apartment, a heart-wrenching sight awaited the investigators. Irene Schnapp suffered a barrage of over 15 vicious blows to her head, inflicted by an axe or hatchet. The room bore gruesome evidence of the tragedy, with Irene's lifeless body lying unclothed in her blood-soaked bedroom. Amidst the chilling scene, a crimson-stained footprint on a pillowcase was discovered, becoming a vital clue that held the potential to unlock the mystery behind her tragic demise. Peter Stowasser, a 41-year-old man, stepped forward to share his account with the investigators. As a friendly acquaintance of Irene Schnapps, he revealed that he may have been the last person to have seen her alive. Shortly after sharing his connection to Irene Schnapps, Stowasser's life took an unexpected turn. The police began frequent visits to his doorstep, and one Saturday, June 17, 1985, Stowasser found himself taken to the Middle Assault Prosecutor's Office, where he spent the entire day under intense scrutiny, facing a barrage of questions regarding Irene's tragic murder. He confessed to developing feelings of attraction towards her, envisioning a potential romantic connection. However, Irene, still grieving the loss of her husband, expressed the need for time and space before considering any new relationships. As Stowasser eagerly anticipated the right moment to express his romantic feelings, he maintained a friendly connection with Irene. He extended invitations to his lively gatherings, hosting barbecues for neighbors and friends in an effort to ensure she didn't feel alone. However, 
their potential relationship was abruptly shattered when Irene met her tragic end, casting suspicion upon Stowasser as the primary suspect. Law enforcement also obtained a search warrant for Stowasser's residence. During the search, they discovered a quilt that bore suspicious-looking stains, possibly blood-related. Additionally, from his car, investigators seized a pair of white work gloves and a metal strip exhibiting reddish spots. Upon conducting tests on the quilt, it was revealed to contain human blood, accompanied by hairs that seemed to match those of the victim. Stowasser, however, maintained that the stains on the quilt originated from menstrual blood belonging to another woman he was involved with. As the investigation progressed, Stowasser underwent a lie detector test, which he did not pass, although the results of such tests were not considered admissible in court. Additionally, it came to light that he had a history of serving time in jail for stalking a former girlfriend. However, the police eventually eliminated Stowasser as a primary suspect, largely due to a significant discrepancy in shoe sizes. Stowasser wore size 12 shoes, whereas a bloody footprint at the crime scene indicated a size 6 shoe. This unexpected mismatch in foot size shifted the focus of the investigation elsewhere. However, on October 28, 1985, the breakthrough in the case occurred. On that very day, Nathaniel Harvey embarked on a rampage through the southern part of West Windsor, ultimately leading to a significant turning point in the investigation. The initial call that reached the dispatch center reported an alarming incident in Dutch Neck Estates, it was a chilling account of a 13-year-old girl who had narrowly escaped an attempted abduction from her own home, and the man covered her mouth in an attempt to take her away. However, her bravery prevailed as she managed to free herself and let out a piercing scream, alerting her parents to the danger. Startled by the commotion, he fled the scene. After fleeing the home in Dutch Neck Estates, that man broke into another house, probably to hide from the police. He was confronted by the homeowner. He turned on the light and saw Nathaniel Harvey standing there threatening him with an ax. Sensing the imminent danger, Harvey swiftly pivoted, shattering the glass door with a powerful swing of the ax and ran off into the woods. With a chilling affinity for axes, Harvey had developed a disturbing pattern of wielding these menacing tools to instill fear in his victims. Even when armed with a knife during one of the assaults he committed, he deceitfully claimed to possess an axe, further fueling the terror. It wasn't lost on the astute law enforcement officials that the murder weapon used in the Irene Schnapps killing was believed to be an axe, adding another haunting connection to Harvey's modus operandi. A short time later, investigators diligently canvassed the area, and their sharp eyes caught sight of Harvey traversing a soybean field, and then ran off into the woods. The police swiftly descended upon the scene, converging on Harvey's location near the Princeton Arms shopping center. It was there at the intersection of Old Tretton Road and Dorchester Drive that a state trooper apprehended Harvey. During questioning, Police learned of the extent of Harvey's one-man crime spree. He confessed to a string of burglaries that had struck fear into the community. However, the extent of his depravity became even more harrowing as it revealed the details of a recent assault. Prior to the tragic murder of Irene, Harvey had abducted a young girl from East Windsor, forcefully taking her to an abandoned building nestled along Dutch Neck Road. He revealed that the victim who was actually Donna Machow, innocently stepped out onto her deck to indulge in a cigarette, only to be seized by his relentless grip. After Harvey's arrest, the 13-year-old girl was called to identify if Harvey was the man who attacked her on October 28, 1985. Through her courageous testimony, she ultimately identified Harvey as her assailant. The authorities made a difficult decision not to pursue charges in the case due to the extremely brutal and perverse nature of the attack. 
considering the potential impact it would have on the victim's well-being. However, a breakthrough came when investigators finally received the search warrant and conducted a thorough search of Harvey's car in November 1985, which was located in the Princeton Arms apartment complex. Inside, they uncovered compelling evidence directly linking him to the Irene Schnapps murder. Alongside stolen items from various recent burglaries, a significant discovery was made. A Seiko watch that was positively identified as belonging to Irene and having been taken from her apartment at the time of the tragic murder. This crucial find provided a solid connection between Harvey and the crime. In an intriguing twist, it was discovered that Harvey's wife resided in the same apartment complex as Irene. However, this information had to be kept confidential due to his wife's reliance on state assistance. Additionally, authorities asserted that Harvey initially admitted to the murder of Irene during his questioning at the West Windsor Police Headquarters where he was confronted with various matters. It was during this intense moment that Harvey requested to speak with his father who offered him crucial advice to do the right thing. In a surprising turn of events, Harvey then made a confession regarding the Irene Schnapps murder. Following Harvey's apprehension, the quilt that had been seized from Stowasser, the neighbor of Irene, who was also seen as a person of interest in the murder, was returned to him. Additionally, the glove and metal strip confiscated from his car under what testing by prosecutors revealing negative results for the presence of blood. In 1986, Harvey was convicted for the murder of Irene Schnapps. However, four years later in 1990, the state Supreme Court overturned his conviction, stating that his confession had been obtained without properly informing him of his Miranda rights. Harvey, who now maintained that his confession was coerced, immediately retracted his statement. This turn of events raised concerns about the validity of his initial confession and ignited a debate about whether he should have been reminded of his Miranda rights after speaking with his father. The question of Harvey's confession became a point of contention as conflicting accounts emerged. According to Evett Kleiner, the attorney of Harvey, he denied confessing to the murder of Irene, contradicting the police's assertion that he had admitted to the crime even though the confession was not recorded. The initial conviction was overturned based on the court's ruling that Harvey should have been reminded of his Miranda rights after requesting to speak to his father during questioning. In 1994, as the case went to a second trial, the focus shifted to the crucial evidence of blood found at the crime scene. The prosecution presented DNA evidence that revealed genetic traits matching both Harvey's blood sample and the stains on a box spring in Irene Schnapp's apartment. The DNA testing, although still in its early stages, indicated that Harvey could not be ruled out as a contributor. To further strengthen their case, prosecution experts utilized dot intensity analysis, a technique that estimated the consistency between the blood characteristics found at the scene and Harvey's DNA. They determined that such a match would occur in only one out of every 1,400 African-American individuals. However, the defense experts countered, arguing that the ratio could potentially be as low as 1 in 50. This time, Harvey was convicted and received the death sentence. However, this verdict was upheld by a divided state Supreme Court in 1997 with some justices expressing differing views. Justice Allen B. Handler, in his dissenting opinion, carefully scrutinized the 64-page analysis of the DNA testing presented in the case. He voiced his doubts and expressed confidence that at some point in the future, either the state or federal court would likely reverse the decision. In a surprising turn of events, according to an article in the New York Times on May 15, 2005, Kleiner, the attorney of Harvey, pointed a finger of accusation at Peter Stowasser, a former neighbor of Irene. Although Stowasser was once considered a possible suspect by the police, he was subsequently ruled out.
Kleiner implicated Stowasser, who was now 61 years old and residing in Heightstown, in both the Irene case and the murder of Donna Machau from East Windsor, who went missing in 1984 and whose body was discovered in 1995. These claims made by Kleiner garnered significant attention, making headlines in the New Jersey section of the Sunday New York Times. He also strongly disputed the accuracy of the blood DNA evidence presented during Harvey's second trial, claiming it to be flawed and contaminated. Additionally, he demanded further DNA testing on other pieces of evidence collected in the case, suggesting that they could have implicated Stowasser instead. Kleiner raised concerns about missing evidence, including the absence of hair from the quilt. He expressed suspicion regarding the classification of the retrieved hair, noting that it was initially labeled as Caucasian and later had the phrase, and one Negroid hair. Kleiner alleged that all the hair evidence, technician's notes, and microfilm have mysteriously vanished, leading him to believe that the hair evidence never actually existed. Capsack, who continued to serve as a prosecutor in Middle Assault County, expressed unwavering confidence in Harvey's conviction, firmly asserting that Stowasser played no part in the crime. According to Capsack, Stowasser was initially considered as a possible suspect in the case, but he was ultimately eliminated as a prime suspect. The decisive factor was the discovery of a size 6 bloody sneaker print on the victim's pillow which contradicted Stowasser's size 12 foot. Interestingly, the article failed to mention that Harvey himself wore a size 6 sneaker. However, he clarified that Stowasser's involvement was merely circumstantial and not indicative of his guilt. In April 2007, Judge John F. Malone of the State Superior Court made a decision that dashed Harvey's hopes for a new evidentiary hearing and dismissed his habeas corpus challenge. He overturned Harvey's 1994 conviction, originally a death sentence, due to inadequate legal assistance provided to him during the early 1990s. Despite this development, Harvey, 65 years old, would still serve a 70-year sentence for a separate charge. The death sentence he received in 1994 had been reduced to life in prison without parole when New Jersey abolished capital punishment in 2007. Prior to this abolition, Harvey had spent 20 years on death row, although the state had not carried out an execution since 1963. However, late in November 2020, Harvey died in the State Woods State Prison in Bridgeton, which eventually closed all the doors of any further investigation. Peter Stowasser was considered a suspect in the murder of Donna Machau. The remains of Machau were found in 1995, approximately a mile away from the location of the Irene crime scene. It was claimed that Machau and Stowasser were both enrolled in classes at Mercer County College during the fall of 1983. It was pointed out that after Machau went missing, Stowasser did not attend the spring session classes that he had previously registered for. However, Stowasser maintains that although he attended Mercer County College, he had no knowledge of Machau or any connection to her. Harvey also was connected to Donna Machau, as the discovery of Donna's remains was in a wooded area near the farm where Harvey had briefly been employed, which raised suspicion. Adding to the puzzle was the finding of her abandoned car near a sewer plant conveniently within walking distance of Harvey's residence. These curious circumstances were enough for authorities to focus their attention on Harvey, exploring the possibility of his involvement in the case. Finally, in the last week of April 2023, New Jersey Attorney General Matthew J. Platkin announced that the conclusive identification as the person responsible for the assault and murder of Donna Machau the state's attorney general said the case was finally cracked when investigators took a fresh look at this decades-old mystery. Colonel Patrick Callahan, superintendent of the New Jersey State Police, said that as four decades have passed, the memory of a young life cruelly taken away still lingers, 
haunting the hearts of those who loved her. The predator responsible callously discarded her remains in a shallow grave, leaving them undisturbed for over a decade. However, time cannot extinguish the burning desire for justice. Even though the perpetrator met his fate behind bars, serving time for another heinous crime and ultimately passing away in 2020, it does not diminish the significance of this long-awaited resolution. We commend the relentless efforts of the Central Regional Cold Case Task Force and the dedicated state police forensic scientists who hopefully have brought a modicum of solace to the victim's grieving family after all these years. The determination and dedication of law enforcement and forensic experts serve as a reminder that the pursuit of justice knows no time limit. What are your thoughts on this case? Share your opinion in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.